The title of my sermon or my talk is Fear Not. And I'm not a public speaker. I always say that. I'm a writer. And so my husband's like, you're not going to be here reading, are you? And I'm like, well, I'm a writer. Um, so <laughs> I will read what I wrote. <laughs> um, so has anyone here ever been scared? <laughs> has anyone ever been literally paralyzed with fear? Unable to take another step? I have. I have always been afraid of heights. Every time I go on a plane, I close my eyes before it, it, it takes off. I whisper a, point, a prayer, and then I don't open my eyes until, Mariah will tell you, I won't open my eyes until we're up in the air. And then when we're going down, I do the exact same thing because I feel butterflies in my stomach. I am petrified and would close my eyes and just think about God and please be with the pilot and all of that. But um, one of the greatest fears I have ever experienced was not when my first marriage ended and wondering what I'm going to do with, a, with being a single mom. It was not when I miscarried my third child, and it was not even when we ventured to Washington State not knowing what to expect, the unfamiliar. All of these were fearful at first, but one of the greatest fears I have ever experienced was when I took Christian, my son, and Kasha, my niece, to Disney World and got on a ride. I thought my life was going to be over. I saw my life flash before my eyes while people around me were laughing hysterically. And I had a picture. I was going to bring the picture so Ken could show, but I couldn't find it. I had a picture. <laughs> I was literally frightened before beyond imagination. You see, I was not supposed to go on the ride, which was a haunted house, and then it had a ride that goes up, and then it drops. I saw it, and I knew I wasn't going on that ride, but I went in the house, making sure that Christian was okay. He was eight years old at the time, what I did not know is that when you went in, you couldn't go back out. You had to go through that experience and then get off the ride. And I had no choice because they said, once you're in, that's it. And I started feeling fearful. Got in that little car. I could have probably said, okay, I'm not doing it and made a whole lot of, but I did not. I wasn't thinking got in, got buckled in, and we maneuvered through. It was about three minutes. Maneuvered through, went through, navigated through, and all kind of little scary things came out. And I'm afraid of scary movies and anything scary. And then we zoomed up. And I thought that I was going to die. Like, Christian was screaming and laughing. Kasha was screaming. Everybody was screaming and laughing. And I thought I was going to die. And it zoomed up, and then it dropped. My heart fell. And when I thought I was about to have a heart attack, like a literal heart attack, I'm crying. I wish I had the picture to show you. My face, I'm crying. And then... It stopped. And I said, I will never, and I have never been back to an amusement park. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
And you may laugh because to you, that's like, that's not a really good thing to be scared about. But I was literally petrified. You know, you were thinking, you know, this fear of height or fear of th um, scary things is not the same as the death or loss. Um, it, but to me, I have control over what I do with my attitude and with my behavior after someone dies or after I have a loss, after I get a bad news. But I had no control over where this little car was going. I had no control. I couldn't say, get me out of here. I had no control for those three minutes. I had absolutely no control over what was happening to me. And so I was afraid. Surprisingly, the Bible has much to say about fear. In my research, I found that fear is mentioned or, uh, over 365 times. And it was said to different people as responses to whatever circumstances they were going through. Remember Joseph? Remember Moses? And remember Joshua and the many more who were told, fear not. Based on the many times fear not is mentioned, I have concluded that God does not want his children to be afraid. I'm not talking about the fear I described where I thought my life was going to end. Rather, God does not want us to be afraid in our life struggles or in our decision makings. And God has given us his word to help us relinquish fear and rejoice in knowing he is always with us. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul advised Timothy not to be afraid because he was young and, it was, and he was about to embark on a massive calling on his life to be a pastor. Especially, specifically, Paul stated, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. The King James Version says self-discipline. You might say, Brenda, I know this. And all the other scriptures on, being and not, on not being afraid. Well, if that's the case, why then is why, then why is fear our first response to, uns, to uncertain circumstances and challenges in our lives? Why? And, and do we not believe God's word? Is there a better way? Is there not a better way to respond to the challenges that come our way? When my former sister-in-law, a few weeks ago, called me to tell me that her mom was in the hospital dying of COVID, my immediate response was fear and then tears. Then being a Christian, I turned to God's word to comfort her and to comfort my former father-in-law and my ex-husband and other in-laws in the family. Last Thursday, when my brother, who is two years my senior, suffered a massive stroke that left his right side paralyzed and then was diagnosed with COVID, again, I was fearful that my brother was going to die. I did not sleep at all Thursday night last week, but Friday morning, when I got up at 4.30 a.m. in the morning to spend time in devotion, the Lord sent this verse to me. The Holy Spirit took me to 2 Timothy 1.7. We must understand that fear is not of God. Yes, we've read in, in Proverbs 9.10 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We've also read in Philippians 2.12 to, 
to work our own work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. However, this is not the same fear that the enemy wants you to have when you encounter difficult times. We need to understand that we can have fear, we can have good, and we can have bad fear. Understanding the difference will help us to believe God when he says, fear not. So what's the difference? I'm glad you asked. Good fear is when we were told in Washington State to slowly back away, turn, and run like crazy if we ever encountered a mama bear with its cubs. Good fear can sharpen and heighten your senses to make you jump into survival mode that could benefit you and others in a fire situation or a natural disaster. I have a, a healthy fear of the police, and so I watch my speed when I'm driving in my Lincoln MKZ that can go up to 160 miles per hour. My healthy fear of alligators would keep me from jumping in a breeding place such as the St. John's River in Florida. And my healthy fear of lightning storms prevents me from running around during such storms. But as Christians, a healthy fear of God is biblical. Proverbs 1, 7 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Means this means that um, reverence and awe, recognizing that he is our creator and sustainer. <clears throat> In Proverbs 9.10, Solomon continues that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. His father David knew this. And now Solomon also understands that divine reverence brought godly understanding. Understanding to know that the same creator of the universe has the power to give us strength through Christ Jesus to free us from bad or unhealthy fear. So what is unhealthy fear? Unhealthy fear can, can put you in a paralyzed state where you find yourself trapped in bondage. I've learned that this is not God's desire for us. As Paul explains in 2 Timothy 1.7, I'll read it again. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but what did he give us? A spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of self-discipline. I've learned that God desires us to grow in our relationships with him with our families, with our church family, and other believers. He wants us to grow in our faith in him by following Jesus' example of total dependence on him. We call this sanctification. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, Paul tells us that it is God's will that we should be sanctified. And James reminds us in in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, when he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith de develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So it is God's desire that we persevere in our trials. And some of us have had so many, we stop counting. He wants us to finish the race so that we will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This process is not cheap. He calls you and he calls me to pick up our cross and follow him. This means we may encounter many problems that can incite fear in our lives, especially, especially for me this month. 
I've learned that to be a follower of Christ means to be an enemy of the prince of this world who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We, we give him the victory when we respond in fear and allow fear to take control of our lives. As for me, I will not allow him to win. I should be home right now, crying my eyes off because of the news I got yesterday. But that's what the enemy wants. He wants us to wallow in sorrow and heartbreak over things we have no control. I have victory over fear because of, of Jesus who lives in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. There are powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places opposing our faith. It is in the face of both earthly and eternal enemies that the Lord would remind us to fear not. In fact, in Matthew 5, 11, Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of manner against you because of me. And he says, rejoice and be glad. Fear can rob you of joy and paralyze you from knowing, from moving forward into all that God has called you to. Instead of a spirit of fear, you have been given a spirit of power, of love, and of discipline. God gives us power. Before he went into the clouds, Jesus said in Acts 1.8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. How can I be a witness if I am chained up in fear? How? This kind of power leaves no room for fear or doubt. When, I've, when a believer has the Holy Spirit working in and through him or her, there is nothing that cannot be accomplished in working in accordance to the will of God. Not to mention, Paul says in Romans 8, 11, and if the spirit of him who rose Jesus from the dead is living in you, living in me, <coughs> He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. If you have unhealthy, health, unhealthy fear that is preventing you from experiencing the life in Christ that you are destined to live, then you need to examine yourself and remember that you were given a spirit of power. Secondly, God gives us love. When we walk in a spirit of love as Christ did, unhealthy fear is driven from far away from us. Jesus walked to the cross in a spirit of love, love for you and love for me. And we can assume that he walked out of the grave in the same empowered spirit of love. Don't forget, this is the same spirit, same spirit alive in you and in me. We have it. The next time you're experiencing fear of any or any of its associations like anxiety and worry or doubt in it, uh, uh, or doubt, examine yourself. Make sure you're walking in a spirit of love. Finally, God gives us self-discipline or sound mind. It takes a lot of discipline to recognize fear and deal with it appropriately. It's simple 
It's simply easier to let it go, to shrug it off, and just call it a fact of life. I hear that all the time. Well, it's life. We struggle. We go through this. We put labels to our fears. Oh, I struggle with anxiety. And it's, a, it's an illness, but there's a remedy. Jesus Christ, we have the remedy. He, we have access to it. All we have to do is reach out and take it. The issue is fear is not a fact of life God has for you in Christ. It's not. That's a lie from the enemy. Paul wraps up his encouragement to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7 by reminding him that he has been given a spirit of self-discipline discipline, along with love and power. Discipline is a vital ingredient in the process of sanctification. We need discipline to take the time necessary to accurately diagnose the fear we're experiencing even more and even more discipline to deal with it. You have to do something. You can't sit back and say, well, the Lord will take care of it. How? You have to do something. Read his word. Believe his word. Know what, what it is that you're afraid of. My friends, it is obvious in our Christian, uh, it is obvious and how we Christians react to what is happening around us, that we need power. We need love. We need self-discipline to deal with fear. We desperately need discipline to examine ourselves each moment of the day. Stand connected to the source of life each moment of the day. We need discipline to form new habits in identifying healthy fear from unhealthy fear. And we need abundant power and outrageous love in how we respond to fear. Thankfully, through Christ, we have been given a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Yes, I, I express grief when bad things happen to, my, to me or happen to my family. I cry, I mourn, and it's okay to do that. Jesus mourned for his friend that, that passed. He cried, it said Jesus wept. And it seems that right now, all of that is happening. Last week, Thursday, my brother suffered a, a stroke. He's still in the hospital in Nassau. My sister, my sister-in-law is there with him. She has to do all of that by herself. And we're praying. That's all we can do is pray, pray, comfort. And then on Monday, my former sister-in-law calls me and tells me that Christian's grandmother passed away. So I'll be leaving tomorrow night to go to New Jersey to a funeral for Monday. And then yesterday, my nephew, he's 35, calls me. Auntie, what's this I'm seeing on social media, on Facebook? about Darlene. Darlene is his sister. R.I.P. Darlene. R.I.P. And I'm like, I don't know. So I call my sister in Florida. This is a, um, not Darlene's mom, because Darlene's mom is in the Bahamas. I call my sister, and my sister tells me, yeah, it's true. She's crying because she sees I'm calling, and she knows. My niece's been sick since last year, October. And she decided to go to Haiti to look for treatment. And my niece did not come back. My niece lost her life yesterday. Doctors in the Bahamas didn't know what was wrong with her. 
She leaves behind three children, 18-year-old, a 14-year-old, and an 8-year-old. This is the aunt of the little girl that I bought here. This is the aunt of the little girl. My sister is beside herself. And after I've done, I did my crying, I had to, you know, call, but she can't hear me. This is her se the second child she, had, she has to bury. My nephew, who's, who was younger, who was older than the little girl's mom, he passed away by, with, from a tragic car accident in 2010. And now, 2022, she's going to bury another child. And men, you don't know because you, don't, you haven't birthed children. But the pain that a mother goes through from birthing a child and then to lose that child is unbearable. And I hear her. And all I have to say, I call her this morning. She's still crying. And I just tell her that it's in God's hands. Right now, people don't need to hear if you lost and you're in pain, you have experienced um, cancer, you have experienced um, a, a, a disease that, that um, you're told, an illness that you're told there's no treatment. You think it's hopeless. You do not see how you will survive this. But I'm here to tell you that there's hope. That the same God that raised Jesus from the dead, he is with you to comfort, to heal, to give peace. So fear has no place in the heart of the Christian. The only thing I can do is surrender. Surrender my hurt. Surrender my pain. Surrender my fear. And I ask your prayers for my family. Because right, left, and center are under attack. But we cannot allow the enemy to have not even an ounce of victory. Because even in death, God's, God allows this to happen for his glory. Some good will come out of this. He's trying to tell us something. We need to wake up. Because this earth is not our home. Jesus needs to come and get us. Come, Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. And when we experience fear, we have Jesus because he's able. He is able to keep us and help us if we ask. He's not going to do anything that we don't ask. But if you're praying and I'm praying and we're asking, he gives. And whether, whether you ask or not, he's always there. Because his goodness falls on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So keep praying. Keep praying for that weird child. Keep praying for, for um, the person who is struggling. Keep praying for the person who has not accepted. Keep praying because God is able. So I would like to encourage you to any time you experience fear. I write it down in my journal. I say, God, I give my fear to you. And I name them specifically. I give you this fear. I give you that fear. Take it. Do what you will with it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I want to experience your joy. I want to rejoice always. That's it. And today, I, that's it. That's all I want. And I hope that's what you want, to walk in the joy of the Lord 
every single day, regardless of what is going on around you. That's it. That's it. If that is your will, if that is your desire, stand up with me so we can pray. That you want to walk in the joy of the Lord every single day of your life. Because circumstances will come and go. And if you are focused only on circumstances, you are in bondage. You are trapped. And we, God does not want that. He has come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but you gave us the spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. We thank you, Father. We thank you that today we are free. Those of us who have fear, Lord, we release them in Jesus' name. We release them, Father, because sometimes these fears that we have keep us from doing your work, keep us from walking into the, the plan that you have for our lives. We ask you, Father, that you will give us your Holy Spirit who walks with us every single day. Thank you for Jesus, our advocator, that he will, we will continue to reach to him and ask him for help. If I can only say, Jesus, help me, that's all I need to say. Thank you for the victories that you have uh, given us in our lives over certain things that we have. We have gotten victory over. But now, Lord, I pray for my sister. I pray for my sister-in-law, my brother, my in-laws, Father, I pray for all of us who are going through something that you will allow us to relinquish it all to you because that's the only way we will experience the joy and the peace that you give. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.